Hello everybody and welcome back. Today we're talking about airplane performance. This is mainly so you can read performance charts, but also so you can calculate your performance when you go flying. And if you think you're too cool to calculate some performance figures, this is something that can happen to you. You can see in this video the airplane is starting to take off. It's trying to get airborne, but it just can barely maintain its altitude. And eventually it finds some trees and things don't exactly end well. Feel free to pause and read the NTSB findings for that particular crash. Now then, onto more happy and positive things. Couple things to get out of the way before we start. Our performance is based on what we call standard atmospheric conditions or a standard day. And that happens to be at sea level with 15 degrees Celsius and 2992 on the altimeter. As you might imagine, we don't have those conditions happening all the time and that's why we have performance charts so that we can interpolate and calculate our performance for our particular day at our particular airport in our particular airplane. Things that affect your performance negatively are high humidity, high temperature, and high altitude. You combine all those, you get a high density altitude. Now, if you remember, a density altitude is pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. In plain English, density altitude is the equivalent altitude that the airplane thinks it is at and it performs accordingly. In other words, when you have a high density altitude, the air is thin, so you have less lift, your engine produces less power, and your propeller produces less thrust. And so all those things combined, you have a high density altitude. The airplane thinks it's super high, when in reality, it really isn't. It feels like that because the air is a lot thinner due to all those factors. Now then, how do we find this pesky density altitude? We take our elevation, we correct that for non-standard pressure, that'll give us our pressure altitude. We take the pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature and you get density altitude. And believe it or not, there's a chart for that. Here's an example we'll work through. We'll say our altimeter is 2925, 27 degrees Celsius, and the elevation is 5250. So the way this chart works, on the right hand side you can correct for your non-standard altimeter. In other words, if it's not 2992 outside, you need to correct for non-standard pressure. Our altimeter is right between 29.2 and 29.3. So if we work out the little interpolation there, that's 626 feet that you have to add to your elevation to get your pressure altitude. Now if we look at the left hand side of the chart, you can come in with that pressure altitude of 5876. From the bottom you can follow the temperature line and then where they intersect, if you go all the way over to the left, it's going to give you your density altitude of 8,500 feet. In other words, you are at an elevation of 5,000 feet, but your airplane when it takes off will feel like it's taken off from 8,000 feet elevation. On a lot of the automated weather stations, you'll hear density altitude like at this airport. Automated weather observation. Altimeter 2, 9, niner, niner, 8. Remarks. Density altitude 1,300. So now you know how to find density altitude. Let's look at an actual airport with some weather to do our performance calculations. I'm going to go to Sky Vector and zoom in to this lovely Papa Oscar Yankee Airport. And here's the weather at that airport. Opening up the page, you see that it's got runway 1331 and it's 6,000 feet long. The elevation is 5,000 feet. The chart I'll be using in this example is from a Cessna 152. Keep in mind a couple things. One of them is that some manufacturers do not provide really good takeoff data like this example. You only get a couple numbers for takeoff and landing and you can't account for any other temperature and pressure differences. Another little note is that different manufacturers provide different looking charts and we'll go through a couple of them just so you're familiar with them. A really big emphasis on these performance charts is that you always want to read the terms and conditions. All the notes, all the conditions, all the stars and everything that's in the chart, make sure you read all those little notes because it could come into play. For example, in our takeoff chart, it says that you'll be using flaps 10, you'll have full power before you release the brakes and you're going to be on a paved runway with no wind. Now that's probably not going to be the case. And also one of the notes says that you'll be using a short field takeoff. Chances are that's not how you'll be taken off, so make sure you read everything there and get familiar with what the numbers say. Also in real life, add a bunch of distance to your numbers, just in case. Alrighty then, let's actually look at this little chart. So we know our elevation is 5,000, and if we look, our temperature is minus 8. Our chart only goes down to 0 degrees, and since we don't have anything negative, we'll just use 0. This will be a quick example, so we won't do the pressure altitude conversion thing, but we'll just look at the ground roll of 1040 and the total to clear a 50-foot obstacle of 1970. 
just as a review. The ground roll number is from when you apply power to when you get off the ground. And the 50 foot obstacle number is from when you applied power until you took off and then climbed 50 feet. Okay, so our 5,000 foot numbers are 1040 and 1970. Now, if we read the notes like we should, number three says you should decrease your distances 10% for every nine knots of headwind. So if we take 13 knots that our wind is, divided by nine, you get 1.44. You multiply that by 10%, you get 14%. In other words, 15% of a decrease in your takeoff distance. So we can subtract that from our ground roll number and the 50 foot obstacle and you get 884 and 1675. Now those are the numbers you would put on a written test. In real life, I would probably shoot for about 1200 feet on the ground roll and let's say 22, 2300 feet on the over 50 foot obstacle just to be on the safe side. That's simple enough, right? Let's level up and do a difficult example. Here are some new numbers for the new example. Here's your weather. We'll be at an elevation of 3000 feet a runway is still the same runway, we'll just make it 3,000 feet for laughs and giggles. First of all, we need to figure out what our pressure altitude is. Now we know our elevation and we know our altimeter setting. You might remember that density altitude chart where you can convert the pressure altitude by using the right hand side of the chart. A quick rule of thumb is that 1 inch of mercury equals 1,000 feet. So if you take your 2942 and you subtract your altimeter, yes, do it in that order, take your altimeter minus 2992 you'll end up with minus 0.5. And if you multiply that by 1,000, you have minus 500 feet. In other words, you have to take your elevation and subtract 500 feet from it. And voila, look at that. You have your pressure altitude of 2,500 feet. If you look at your chart, there are absolutely no numbers for 2,500 feet. And if you look at your temperature, there is no temperature for 25 degrees Celsius either, which means you'll have to do a little bit of thinking and some math. And you'll probably see something like this on the written test if not for your private, then some point in the future. To get your number, you do a little bit of math, and there we go, look at that. For the ground roll at 2,500 feet, you have 955. And for the 50 foot obstacle, you have 1780. Then for 30 degrees, you have 1030. And then you also have 1920. So now we have our numbers for 2,500 feet. We just don't have them for 25 degrees Celsius. So we'll go ahead and interpolate for that as well and you get 992 for the ground roll and 1850 for your total to clear a 50 foot obstacle. All right, so far so good. Now if we look at note number three, it says decrease by 10% for every nine knots again. And so now we come to a little bit of a dilemma. Our wind is 180 and our takeoff runway is 13 or a heading of 130. That's not an exact headwind. So how do you find your headwind? With this lovely chart. On the left side you have headwind, on the bottom you have crosswind. The numbers on each axis, they represent the wind speed. On the outside arc, you have degree numbers, and those are the number of degrees between your runway heading and the wind direction. So in our case, we have a 50 degree difference between 130 and 180. So we find 50 on the chart, 50 degrees difference. And then we can follow it down to our wind speed of 13 knots. And if you look straight across to the left, your headwind is 9 knots roughly. And if you look straight down, your crosswind will be about 10 knots for that takeoff. So our headwind is 9 knots, in other words we have to subtract 10% from our takeoff distance once again. So 992 becomes roughly 893 and then 1850 becomes 1665. Hopefully that made at least a little bit of sense, I did go fairly quick through this. Now then, onto a different manufacturer's takeoff chart. It looks kinda scary, but it really isn't. Just like with the other chart, there are some conditions, and you can read through those if you'd like. Let's make sure you understand this chart. The way it works is you follow the pressure altitude uh, line slope until you meet your temperature and once those two meet you go straight across. So for example if your pressure altitude was 9000 you would follow the slope of those lines for 8 and 10,000 you'd be right in between them and you'd follow that until you met with your temperature. Let's say that your temperature was 20 so you'd follow the slope of your pressure altitude of 9000 until you met with 20 degrees once those two meet, you can follow straight across to the reference line. Let's do one more. Let's continue on. Let's say that our weight is 2200 pounds. So you would take your line that's now at the reference line and you would follow the slope of where you ended up all the way down to 2200. And once 2200 and the line that you have meet up, you go straight across to your next reference line. I'm a little bit lazy, so we'll just follow their example they have on the left-hand side at the top there. So now, looking at this chart, we can follow the temperature on the red line there from the bottom until it meets our pressure altitude. 
and our pressure altitude is 5650. Once those two lines meet, we can run right across over to the next reference line, and that's for weight. And our weight is 2950, which I'm assuming is the very left-hand side. So we don't have to do anything. We don't have to follow any sort of lines. We're going right straight across to the next reference line. And then they said we had nine knots of headwind. For headwind, if you look, you go down. And for tailwind, you would go up. So for nine knots of headwind, we parallel that line and go down to nine knots. And then once those lines meet again, nine knots and uh, the line that we have, we go straight across to the next reference line. If we want to know our ground roll, we go straight across, and that's going to be 1375. And if we want to know our takeoff over 50 foot obstacle, then we go follow the slant of the line to the end of the line, or 50 feet, and that happens to be 2300 feet. I hope that wasn't super difficult to figure out. Here's another, it's just in Fahrenheit and not Celsius, and miles per hour instead of uh, knots. Also, this is for landing distance, which is kind of what we're going to look at next. So for landing distance, we're going to be doing the same sort of thing. You have, let's see, what do we have? 25 degrees Celsius, pressure altitude of, let's say, 4,000 feet, weight of 2,800 pounds, and 9 knots of headwind. And so we go and follow from 25 degrees up until we meet roughly 4,000 feet of pressure altitude. And then jog right across to the reference line. And our weight is now 2,800 pounds. So we follow the slant of the line to 2,800. And then go right across all the way to the next reference line. Our headwind is 9 knots, so we'll follow the downsloping line until 9 knots, and then go right across to the next line. Our ground roll for the landing distance happens to be right about 1,000 feet, 1,100 or so. And if we follow the slope line up, it's going to be about 1,700 feet for a 50-foot obstacle clearance. Looking back at our 152 chart, it's basically similar now that you've seen everything. Make sure that when you're using these for real life, you are actually adding a bunch of distance just to be on the safe side and I can't overemphasize the look at the notes part because that's where most mistakes come from on the written test is because people don't correct for wind and runways and all that stuff. So that's going to be it for this video. I was going to do weight and balance as well but this got out of hand and it's 12 minutes long already. That will be the next video. Until then, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning. See you next time.